But if you are, he's listening. And he's waiting for you to run to him. (laughs) To wake him up. And we don't need to panic. We don't need to worry. And then finally the sailors decide to wake up the carpenter. <laughs> and and I, could see the, I could see the scene, right? I mean, think about it. They wake him up. I, I mean, he gets up. He's probably like, you know, maybe a yawn, right? And then he just says, shut up. Peace be still, be muzzled. And everything goes like glass. Everything becomes absolutely, totally calm. And you can see these guys, buckets in hand, right? Uh, you know, water pouring off their beard. They're soaking wet. I mean, look at, I mean, they're just like. I mean, I would be, right? Sometimes, though, Jesus doesn't calm the seas. Sometimes he doesn't bring everything calm. But this is what I do know. He's still in the boat with you. He is still in the boat with you. Let's look back at the text. He says in verse 37, a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking over the boats that the boat was being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. So they woke him up and said, teacher, don't you care that we are going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, silence, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have little faith? Now he asked two questions there. First question he asks is, why are you afraid? The second question he asks is, do you still have no faith? And it was to get them to the third question that was asked in the text. And it says this, who is this? They, well, let me read 41. And they were terrified and asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Wow. It's all to get him to that one question. Who is this? They thought he was prophet. They thought he was healer. Now they know he's Messiah. They see his humanity here and they see his deity. They wanted, they want, Jesus wanted them to know that he is fully God and fully man and in control of everything. Physical, spiritual, it does not matter. He, from the beginning to the end, Jesus is in absolute total control. And he wants to take absolute total control of your life and my life. He wants every part of me. He doesn't want me to hold anything back. And he wants us to grow in the trials. He wants us to trust him in the trials. Trials are for something important in your life, believe it or not. It is to make you more like him. It's to, it's to bring glory to him. It's to get you to a place where you trust him and that you have faith in him and that you believe that he is who he says he is. Because this life is but a vapor and this life is not everything. Jesus is everything. And spending eternity with the people he loves is everything. And so his desire is to get you back to the Imago Dei, the image of God. That is his goal. We fell from that image and now he uses trials to make you more like him. In other words, to restore the image of God in your life that was lost in the garden. And that is is a crucial thing that we forget, especially when we're in trials. But you know people that are close to Jesus because when you see them walking through their trials, they are praising God and they are trusting him. Now, I got a friend, his, his name's Jason, and he, he married this girl named JJ. Jason, his wife died of cancer. They, had, they have four kids, and, 
And it was just a slow, painful six-year process. And when his wife finally died, there was this sweet girl named JJ who reached out to him and said, I am so, they were, they, uh, uh, his, uh, the wife that died's friend was best friends with this, this girl. And so she reached out encouraging him, sending him all these wonderful scriptures. Nine months later, JJ's husband had two kids, school teacher, uh, they, he loved Jesus, was climbing Mount Capitan. He would climbed it 76 times. And when he got to the top, the guy he was climbing with didn't hook up, fell off, pulled him down, and he went splatter on the ground. Okay. This is very dear friends of mine. JJ then was reached out to by Jason. Jason said, hey, uh, you know, this is, this is horrible, but they helped her walk through it while they're married now, okay? They, they, they didn't praise Jesus through the whole day. They were so close to Jesus through this whole thing. They trusted the Lord as they walked through this trial. Now they're married now, and literally just like, uh, and that's the wedding I went to, uh, by the way, in, in the fall when I missed uh, my only Sunday since we started the church. But now they're married and maybe trying for another child. They got six kids together. But, but here's, the, here's the point. His dad just died last week too, by the way. That's another story. But now they're going around the country counseling people uh, about grief, sharing with people what the Lord did in and through their life, through this trial, through this tribulation, and how God can turn beauty from ashes how he can make something ugly and something seem so tragic and, 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 and that you would that most people that don't know Jesus would just give up on life. They would just say, you know what, I've had it, I'm done, I, I don't want this anymore, I'm just and, and just give up and, and live in constant depression and hopelessness and despair. And then you have them who go around to different churches. By the way, he's coming in July to speak here. And they're gonna he's gonna share his story with you and how much he loves Jesus. I got another uh, a friend that his name's John Corson. I don't know some of you might have heard of him before, but John Corson, he lost with a period of a short span of time. He lost his his wife. They were going on a ski trip, and he wrecked the car, and she died. He's a pastor in Oregon, and then uh, a year later, a couple years later, uh, in the exact same spot, his daughter, his sixteen year old daughter, was driving the car and wrecked and died. He just lost another son to a rare disease, uh, what was it, uh, about a year and a half ago. Just a year and a half ago. And so he's lost two kids and a wife. He's done all three of their funerals. But if you talk to him, he did all three of their funerals, and he loves Jesus. He's madly in love with Jesus. And any pastor, any ministry worker that loses a kid or loses a, a parent, everybody ships off to him, and he counsels them because he has walked through the refiner's fire and praised Jesus through it all because he knows that the biggest trial that we will face is death. That's the biggest trial we'll ever face. And he would look you in the eye right now and say, you know what? This life is short and eternity is forever. A million years, a billion years, a trillion years goes by and we will just be getting going. And so the most important thing that you can do is love Jesus through your life. Now, interesting. Why does Jesus take us into the storm? I'll just touch on that just a couple more times. Number one, to make us more like him. Number two, to grow our faith. Number three, to use us in the lives of others. And so I don't know what you're going through, but God wants to use you. I, he wants to use you in the life of other people. And I want to read some scriptures to you right now that, that, that talk about this. Because Paul the Apostle, and they'll be on the screen, and I'm just going to read. There's, there's a bunch of them. I'm just going to read them really quick in kind of a way of application because the word of God has a lot more to say than this knucklehead up here. That's all I can tell you. And he knew that God was preparing these guys, these disciples, because he knew that everybody but Judas and John would get martyred 
Every one of them would die for their faith. Every one of them would stand up and have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ before their lives were taken. Judas, of course, took his own life because he was a miserable man. John was the only one that didn't get martyred. But let me read these to you. And while I'm reading these to you, remember the Apostle Paul got through this only because of his relationship and faith in Jesus Christ. God didn't make his situation easier. As a matter of fact, for Paul, it just got harder. It just got harder. But Paul was able to identify and say, look, Jesus Christ suffered for me. Jesus Christ had his crown of thorns shoved on his head, his back ripped open, his hands pierced, the wrath of God, the sins of mankind poured out upon him on the cross for me. He suffered more than any other, other man ever suffered because his greatest suffering wasn't the, pain, the physical pain, but the fact that your sin and my sin were poured out upon him on that cross. And that God turned his back on him and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why are you forsaken me? Because God was dealing with my sin and your sin on that cross. Let me read these scriptures. 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive. Oh, that's, a, that's an exciting promise, huh? In other words, when I go through this trial, you're doing it because I can comfort others when they go through that same trial? Yeah, that's what it's saying. For just as the suffering of Christ overflows to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that you share in the sufferings, so you also will be sharing the comfort. Wow, thanks, exciting. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not give up, even though our outward person is perish, being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. What's that saying? Things are bad are happening to us and it's building us up on the inside. It's making us more like Christ. For our momentary light affliction. Wait a minute, Lord. Is, I'm not in a light affliction. I got cancer. My, my, my family member passed away. I, my kid's out using drugs. He OD'd again. I had to go to the hospital. I mean, on and on we go, right? But it's a light affliction because our place isn't here. It's in heaven. It's producing for us an absolute and comparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And one more. This is my favorite one. Just kidding. I mean, I love the word of God. Don't get me wrong. Romans 5.3. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. Proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Wow. My goodness. I had a bunch more, but I'm not going to read them this morning. I don't have enough time. But if you're a note taker, I'll give you the scriptures and you can look it up. Um, uh, well, you can ask me afterwards and I'll give them to you. There was, a, there was a sea captain who was actually a first mate for a long time. And he knew how to read charts and he knew how to read maps, but he'd been across this ocean a few times. And so he decided he was just going to wing it. Well, a storm rose and the sea got tossed to and fro and it began to get busted and, 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 and thrown around. And so the man runs, he gets knocked off course and the man runs to get his charts and the boat had been taken um, on water. And his charts were downstairs and they were just soaking wet and getting blown all over and he couldn't get his, his map together. He couldn't get his charts together. And, and all of a sudden they run into the sandbar and literally the ship gets busted into a million pieces and the guy literally lost half his crew. 
because he did not take the time to read the maps and the charts. And when the trial came, it was lost. And Jesus says something similar in Matthew. He says this. He says, there are two kinds of people. Two kinds of people when the storms come. There's the person that builds his, his house upon the rock. And the rock is Christ Jesus. It's a firm foundation. He builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms come and when the waves come, the house stands. But then there's another kind of person who builds his house upon sinking sand, upon, upon the, the, the things of the world, if you will. And what happens to that house? The wind comes, the waves come, and that house is built on sinking sand, and the sand deteriorates underneath the house, and the house comes crashing down because it has no foundation. And so what are you building your house upon? My friend built his house upon the rock. John Corson built his house upon the rock. JJ and Jason built their house upon the rock. My dear sister Tammy has built her house upon the rock. When the cancer came, when the death of a spouse came, when the death of a child came, when the cancer came in Jason's wife's life, their house was built upon the rock and they were not crushed. They were not ruined. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, now we have this treasure in, in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down but not, not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. And so when it comes, and when you're tossed, you can set your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Some of you are going through stuff right now. Cast your cares on him. He cares for you. I'm just going to share one personal story, and I promise I'll close with this. But here's, here's a reality in my life. We were five years into our church plant in Idaho. And things were getting a little bumpy here and there. You know, you always have things going on in the church. And somebody came by and offered to buy my um, uh, house and uh, out of the blue. And so we said yes. And we were moving the last load. And as I was moving the last load, I came around a corner and my trailer went over the line about six inches and coming the other way, there was a student driver who was 14 years old. And he panicked. I pulled back in my lane, no big deal. But he panicked and pulled the wheel this way and the instructor grabbed the wheel and tried to jerk it out of his hand and he actually just jerked it like that and kind of pitched just a little bit sideways and we crashed over on my fog lane head on. I was doing about 60, he was doing about 60. And I got thrown out of the car. I didn't, you know, I just gotten gas and I always wear my seatbelt. That day I didn't put my seatbelt on and the motor actually would have killed me if I hadn't got thrown out of the car and Phineas was in the back. Phineas, uh, the car ended up stopping upside down. Phineas was hanging upside down with a lump on his head. He wasn't breathing. There was gas pouring out of my car. And um, I'm laying on the side of the road and I get up and my wife was following us and she saw the whole thing and Kemp, which he, my wife and I ran and we pulled my son out of the car and we br brought him out of the car and then I just collapsed. Uh, my stomach was in my esophagus. My intestines were on my collapsed lung and I had a four and a half inch rip in my diaphragm. Matter of fact, when I went to get surgery, when the doctor brought the ring out uh, to give the, uh, my wife, he said, I don't know how long this surgery is going to take because everybody's had these injuries. He's been dead and he shouldn't be alive. And so I can remember laying on the side of the road, just pleading with the Lord, Lord, save my son, save my son, save my son, save my son. I couldn't breathe. And then a couple of times I shut my eyes and I said, into, my hand, into your hands, I commit my spirit, like I'm Jesus, right? You know? <laughs> um, but, but that's kind of where I was at, right? 
so Phineas is laying there. He's not breathing. He's got this huge lump on his head. And my buddies are following us that were helping me move pastors. And they get my keys over there. It had oil in it. And we anoint Phineas's head with oil. And we lay hands on him and we pray for him. And, and I'm not exaggerating. Again, this is, this is the true story. It's insane, insane. The lump on his head went away. And he started going, oh, oh that doesn't feel good. Oh. And, I mean, it literally just shrunk on his head. It was amazing. They, 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 they begin to metaflight both cars out. But all, all my buddies later, um, my buddy who was the, uh, uh, the fire chief and the chief, police chief were there. They all go to our, went to our church up there. And the ambulance, the head of the ambulance department was there. They said Phineas wouldn't make the airplane ride because he was gray. And when a little nine-year-old boy is gray, that means his river's lip and it's got a hole in it and, and there's no hope for him. He'll die within a few hours. Well, even the paramedics that flew, the, the paramedics on the chopper said he wouldn't make it. But they didn't tell me. They didn't tell my wife. But through it all, my wife will tell you she had the most peace. And she was like, in, in our city, and you got to understand the background of this, because in our city, there, it, it was a small town of 2,300 and about 10,000 people in the county, but we had like 750 people going to the church. It was amazing revival going on there. And, but, but here's the deal. There were six pastors in that town who had lost a child throughout the last 25 years. And three of those pastors had actually gone, gone, went to our church. Uh, one of them died of leukemia. One of them got shocked and had an a, a, a electrical shock. And the other got killed by a train. And so, the, I mean, these pastors were devastated. And like everybody told me this. And you got to imagine the fear I had, right? So my wife and I had already prepared that we were going to lose Phineas. You know, in our minds, we're like, okay, God, you know. And, and all, these ki- all these kids were girls and boys, their firstborn. It was really weird. It was like a really weird thing and just bizarre. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so, so my wife was just like, she had the peace that surpasses all understanding. And she just said, Lord, if you want to take them, I know you're going to take care of us. Well, I, I get to the hospital. I'm thinking Phineas is dead. He gets metaflighted away and we get to the hospital and all this. And, and, and to make a long story short, uh, or actually make a long story longer. Um, <laughs> I was in the hospital for 30 days and I had a couple of months of rehab. And in that time when I was in the hospital, there was about four days in there where I had so much fear and anxiety um, in, in my, I can't even explain it. It was like, um, I was like, it was like I was all alone. I was like, I, 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 I don't know what Jesus felt like on the cross, but I felt like God had forsaken me. And I would weep and I would, I would, uh, and I'm not a fearful guy. I don't get scared usually. I mean, I, I'm the kind of guy that likes fear. You know, I just do. I just, it kind of gets me going. And, and I was just, and so my buddy Chaz, who was a, a worship leader and a pastor in Pueblo, he wasn't at the time. He was up there and he was staying with me, taking care of me uh, when my wife couldn't be there. And he would just sing worship songs to me in this time. And it would calm me down. It would calm me down. Anyways, I get out of this trial and, and, and my son lives, right? My son shouldn't have lived. And, I, and we get out of this trial and um, I'm in rehab and then I'm in a wheelchair. And then the guy I let preach at my church while, for four, mo- four and a half months while I was out, while I was gone, he tries to take the church from me. And so I'm in this trial. And, but through that, except for that four day period, I had the peace of God that surpassed understanding. And even in that trial, I was pr- crying out to him saying, Lord, I love you. I trust you. Not my will, but your will be done. And just trusting the Lord and, 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 and in that trial. And, and finally, everything calms down. And about a year later, on the exact same, uh, uh, mercy was born on the um, 15th and my wreck was on the 18th. My wife's water breaks, okay, a couple of months before um, Mercy's supposed to be born. And at the time, we were going to name the baby um, Sterling and not Mercy at the time, okay? And so uh, we, she ends up in the hospital. I'm two hours away, and um, I'm having to commute over with the six kids two hours away to the hospital because where we were, there weren't any good hospitals. And we go in with the kids and we spend time with mom. And, you know, I'm trying to stuff a, a, a five-year-old girl in two, two-year-old underwear. And I mean, I'm just messed up, right? 
Uh, I mean, this isn't a job for a dad. Thank God for my daughter Evangeline. He's like, dad, just get out of the way. Let me do this, right? She's nine, nine years old and she's like getting the kids dressed. And well, thank God for little old ladies at the church, okay? And I'm not gonna say what, how old little old ladies are, but thank God for, they, they start bringing me meals because they're feeling sorry for me. And, but here's the deal. On the, on the 15th of August, my wreck was on the 18th. Mercy's born, and she's born with this nasty infection. And um, one, point one was dangerous. Point f- no, point one was dangerous. Point nine was dead. She had point five. Okay, and I don't, I don't remember what it was called, but she's on the incubator and she's in the ICU. And, and, and we walked in there. Uh, my wife and I walked in there on August 18th, three days after she was in ICU. And, and we just automatically realized it was the same day as the wreck. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding poured out on us. And they said, look, we're going to have to give her a spinal tap. We're going to have to put a feeding tube in her. She, she, she's, in, uh, she's getting worse and worse. She's in desperate state. You know, and, and the nurses were Christians. And we prayed for her. And everybody was praying all over the United States. This is no joke. The next morning after everybody started praying for her, we woke up and the infection was gone. And the doctor came in, 29 years doctor in, in NICU, said, I have never seen anything like this. Now, she was in for another three more days. We got to take her home on a Friday and the doctors when the nurses were just tripping out. They're like, you're, you, we were gonna do a spinal tap yesterday and you're taking her out today? All, all this to say, how did I respond in the storm? When things like that come into your life, how are you going to respond? Are you going to say, I mean, you can get bitter. You can get resentful. You can get angry. You can shake your fist at God and you can say, don't you care? God, don't you care that I'm perishing? Don't you care that my spouse has cancer? Don't you care that I'm single? Don't you care that my, 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 fam- my husband left me or my wife left me or my kids in the gut? Don't you care? And we can get to that place. Or we can say, this life is not what matters. What matters is our faith in Jesus Christ that we stand upon the rock and that we live this life and we, we, we say, you know what? I am going to walk through a trial praising God. I'm going to walk through a trial. If, 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 if Lord, if, 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 if I was not even supposed to be able to walk. They were going to take my feet. 56 screws in this, this foot. 13 screws and two plates, 56 screws and seven plates. My feet were like this and they were going to take my foot, but I had, here's the Lord, right? I had the number three trauma surgeon in the nation on call that night. She's like, no, I'm going to save that foot. My orthopedic said, I would have taken the foot. Thanks. Thanks, doc. Stay away from my foot. (laughs) But, but I, I'm in, I'm in constant pain, back broken six places. My leg broke, seven ribs snapped in half. My guts all sh- scrambled. But you know what? Thank you, Jesus, for that trial. Because it made me more like him. It made me glorify him. I can say, what are the chances of that, that number three trauma surgeon in the nation, Carla Smith, being on call that night, right? Right? I, I mean, I could, there's all kinds of ways we can praise God. Phineas shouldn't be here right now. A nine-year-old boy in a head-on collision doing 65. The cops said nobody should have lived. And there's, there's always things that we could complain about or be bitter about or, 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 or shake our fist at God and say, why, God, don't you care that we were perishing? And, and the thing about it is, is, if you look at the text, they were, they were more terrified that Jesus calmed the storm and asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. Because it's faith that pleases God in the trial, out of the trial, coming out of a trial, going into a trial, in the midst of a trial. Boat sinking, boat floating. Although you slay me, Job said, I will trust you. 
As Job sat in a pile of ashes, he had lost all 10 of his kids. He'd lost every dime he had. He had lost all his cattle, his sheep, his money, his resources, his house, his 10 kids. And Satan's perfect, leaves the nagging wife to say, why don't you just curse God and die? Right? As he's scraping the boils on his body, right? But he says this, he says, God, although you slay me, I will praise you. I can't say I'm there. (laughs) I can't say I'm there every day. But we changed our daughter's name to Mercy Has Said. Shall said or has said, they said two different ways, which means steadfast, faithful, loyal love, mercy, everlasting, loving, kindness, faithful, steadfast, loyal love, Grobner. Will you praise him? as he makes you more like him, as he sends you through the refiner's fire. Shall we stand, shall we pray? Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. I just thank you for your mercy. I thank you for saving my son, Lord. Thank you that I didn't have to live with that all my life. But Lord, there's some people in here that had to live with some stuff, Lord. Some guilt, some shame, some condemnation, all the things that the enemy loves to throw at us. Lord, I pray that nobody in here, through the trials, the tribulations, the pain, the suffering, the hopelessness, the shipwrecks, the paddling and lifting in the middle of the ocean and the vast sea. I pray that none of them would grow bitter against you, God, that none of them would grow resentful, that they would trust you, that you're still on the throne, that you have a plan for their life, that you're, you're using them, you're, you're, you're using them to glorify you in some way, some shape, some form. Lord, we don't see it sometimes. We don't know it always, but you're doing it. I pray that you would encourage them this morning, God. I pray that you would let them know the height, the depth, and the width in which you love them. I pray that you would let them know that you will never leave them or forsake them. I pray that you would let them know that you care for them, that they can cast their cares upon you. And you care because you care for them. I pray that you would help them lift their eyes to you, that they would look to you, the author and perfecter and finisher of their faith, God. You would help them to embrace the trial. Knowing that it produces far more beautiful, glorious things. That you would turn beauty from ashes in their life, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.